You have much to learn. I will show you the ways of the desert. Come with me. Do not run. You will only waste your body's water. This is the Duke's son. Why are you waiting? We need their water. Chani, take charge of the newcomers. See that they are safe on the journey. Let's go. I will not have them. I invoke the Untow. You may not challenge a Sayadina. Then who will fight in her name? Jamis. I accept her champion. You're the Lisa and Al-Gaib, but I want you to die with honor. This Chris knife was given to me by my great aunt. It's made from the tooth of Shai Halud. Jonas is a good fighter. He won't let you suffer. You should welcome my blade. This world will kill you. Quicker this way. Death is the test of it. Paul has never killed him. <laughs> You're one of us now. A life for a life. Hey guys, what's happening? Niat here with Film Comics Explained. And as requested, today we'll be exploring the Fremen, as featured in Frank Herbert's amazing Dune universe. Originally known as the Free Men of Arrakis, the Fremen were a subculture of humans descended from the Zen Sunni Wanderers. They were hard in survival, adapted in the harsh environment of the planet, and formed an integral part of the Muad'Dib's Jihad launched by Paul Atreides. I have covered the confusing history and trajectory of Paul Atreides in my video exploring Denis Villeneuve's Dune, links in the description, but here I hope to show how instrumental the Fremen were in his rise to power. First appearing in the 1965 novel Dune, they inhabit the large planet Arrakis, also known as Dune, which is the sole known source in the universe of the all-important Spice Melange. Long overlooked by the rest of the Imperium and considered backward savages, in reality, they were an extremely hardy people that existed in large numbers. The Fremen had come to the planet thousands of years before the events of the novel as the Zen Sunni Wanderers, a religious sect in retreat. As humans in extremis, over time, they adapted their culture and way of life to survive and thrive in the incredibly harsh conditions of Arrakis. The Fremen are distinguished by their fierce fighting abilities and skill at survival in these conditions. With water being such a rare commodity on the planet, their culture revolves around its preservation and conservation. Dune was actually inspired by Herbert's research for an article about the United States Department of Agriculture's attempt to use grasses to stabilize the Oregon dunes. Herbert learned that the moving dunes could swallow whole cities, lakes, rivers, and highways, and said that in studying sand dunes, we must analyze the people of the Kalahari and how they utilize every drop of water. And so, Herbert based Fremen culture in part on the desert-dwelling Bedouin and sand people. For four weeks, I live with the Fremen, hidden in the desert in a community called the Siege. Arrakis is filled with caverns, and there are hundreds of sieges. Millions of Fremen. The origins of the Fremen lay with the Zen Sunni wanderers, who fled prior to the Butlerian Jihad, escaping religious and cultural persecution. Several Zen Sunni settled on Arrakis and made a living by scavenging the desert for anything that could be sold to merchants at the spaceport. At this point, the feared giant sandworms were considered demons. One of their kind, named Selim, was banned from their community for the horrible crime of stealing water, though he was innocent. Of course he came to despise the Zen Sunni way of life. By mistake and a stroke of luck, he learned to ride a worm and no longer considered them demons, but as the physical embodiment of the one god that created and governed the universe. Over time, Selim gathered followers who also preferred a more spiritual and frugal life, and they eventually declared themselves the Free Men of Arrakis. The Free Men ultimately became known as the Fremen.
The Fremen of Arrakis live in communities called Seaches that were capable of containing thousands of people, and each had its own leader called a knave who had absolute authority and ascended to the position by challenging his predecessor. The Fremen system of justice relied primarily on trial by combat, and individuals may challenge each other to the death over matters of etiquette, law, or honor. But there's a catch, as for every action, there must be accountability. And so, the victor of these challenges becomes responsible for the wife, children, and certain possessions of the defeated. The Fremen paid enormous spice bribes to the Spacing Guild to keep the atmosphere of Arrakis free of spy satellites, and they had a long-term plan to terraform the planet. Every Seach also has a Saedina, a wise woman trained in the spiritual traditions of her people, that can serve as a leader or as an acolyte to a holy woman, essentially the Fremen version of a Bene Gesserit reverend mother. As I've already discussed in my other video on Dune, a significant part of the Fremen mythology was actually created by the Bene Gesserit Missionaria Protectiva, an arm of the matriarchy that practices religious engineering. They essentially introduced contrived myths, prophecies, and superstition among the populations of the Empire, with the intent to later exploit them. In the case of the Fremen, a messiah legend had been put in place that is utilized by Paul Atreides to protect him and his mother Jessica. Due to Salim's experience, the Fremen worship the giant sandworms as manifestations of the earth deity they call Shai Halud, and like him, they learn to ride the worms by calling and mounting them using bravery and skill. The Fremen were a deeply spiritual and superstitious people. Over the centuries, they adapted their blend of Zen Sunni faith to their desert environment and adopted the sandworm of Arrakis as a physical manifestation of God. As part of the sandworm life cycle, the spice melange is everywhere on the planet. This, combined with the sparse natural resources on Arrakis, led to the spice melange becoming an integral part of their diet and culture. High levels of exposure to spice has now tinted their eyes to a dark shade of blue called Blue and Blue, or the eyes of Abad. To the native Fremen, the fight for survival had long dominated their cultural identity. The brutal environment of Arrakis necessitated the frugal use of energy and resources, especially water. Additionally, their history with cultural persecution mandated the need for combat knowledge. These aspects saw them emerge as efficient and hardy warriors that used their skill in the environment to fend off opponents with far superior technology and formal training. Water played a vital role in the Fremen culture. Indeed, for the Fremen, water was life. To conserve against the unnecessary loss of water in the desert, Fremen wore a full body filtration system called still suits, which reclaimed the body's moisture. The special fabric is micro sandwich designed to dissipate heat and filter waste while reclaiming moisture. The water is then held in catch pockets and made available to drink through a tube. Additionally, specialized headgear prevented most of the normal loss through the scalp and forehead via perspiration, while masks and nose plugs reclaim moisture from the wearer's breathing. Gloves were also available too, but many Fremen opted instead to rub the juice of the creosote bush on their hands to inhibit perspiration. Amazingly, with a Fremen still suit in proper working order, the wearer lost only about a thimble full of water per day. The Fremen rule was that one's water belonged to the tribe. Thus, when a Fremen died or was killed in combat, rather than being buried or cremated, he or she was rendered down into water. In the case of Amtel, or the ritual combat to the death between two disagreeing Fremen, the water of the loser was used to replenish the victor. The rest was then turned over to the water masters. Herbert even suggested in Dune that the Fremen have adapted to the environment physiologically, with their blood able to clot almost instantly in order to prevent moisture loss. It's safe to say then that Arrakis was a planet that necessitated community and self-sufficiency. I must go. That's all I have to say to you. Won't you stay? We would honor you. Honor requires that I be elsewhere. The Fremen are known for having leathery tanned skin and bright blue within blue eyes. Because they live off their own water storage and inhale and live within the harsh conditions of Arrakis, they ingest copious amounts of spice melange, which in addition to keeping them alive, also increased many of their combat and prescient abilities. The drug comes from the excretions of sandworms, altered by heat, pressure in the water that lies deep below the planet's surface. Called makers by the Fremen, the massive creatures tunnel through the desert sand and appear at the slightest of noise. Because of this, the Fremen have learned how to walk through the desert in a sliding, arrhythmic gait that mimics the natural settling of sand. Used as a psychedelic, the spice is a second function that is crucial to the galactic economy. It grants prescience, the ability to see a little into the future. After computers were outlawed in the world of Dune, 
it's a long story. Spice became crucial to navigation through space. That is why every house was willing to harvest it, despite the huge dangers involved. It's also important to note, however, the spice has some side effects. Navigators who had to take a lot of it and were surrounded by spice gas while they worked actually began to mutate. Minutes after a baby Fremen was born, the amniotic fluid was saved and distilled before eventually being fed to the infant by its godmother in the presence of a Saiyadina. As the baby drank, the godmother would say, here is the water of thy conception. In this way, the child was seen as having been tied to its parents by the bond of water, as well as being tied by extension to the rest of the tribe. Fremen children were raised by their individual households and not communally, but every adult in the community accepted some responsibility for their welfare and the nearer the relationship was to the child's parents, the greater the obligation. The Fremen had learned centuries earlier that weak dependent children would jeopardize an entire siege by demanding time and attention their parents could not spare, while contributing nothing to the tribe. Therefore, independence was encouraged in youngsters so that they would not burden the tribe. The earliest lessons taught was that wasting water in any form was an unpardonable sin, and thus crying was not allowed since it wasted moisture. A Fremen was then educated till maturity by all members of a siege in order to maintain the water principle. They were also taught that cowards, weaklings, and other such undesirables would never be given the opportunity to clutter the gene pool. I will not have them. Jamis, I have spoken. Be still. You talk like a leader, but the strongest leads. Living in the desert with limited sources of water has spurred the Fremen to ritualize and build their society around the collection, storage, and conservative use of all moisture. They conserve the water distilled from their dead, put a great cultural reverence on tears, and consider spitting a sign of respect. Water is collected from the atmosphere in wind traps that condense the humidity and add it to the underground tanks. Personal ownership of moisture is also designated by water rings, which are used as a form of currency. It was considered unlucky to leave free water standing unused unless stored in one of the evaporation-proof basins. Common pools of water were kept in sieges for all of its members to drink from. Each pre-dawn dew gatherers with scythe-like dew reapers gleaned the available moisture from whatever plants grew near the siege. They then brought the morning's harvest to a Saedina to receive her blessing before carrying it to the tribe's communal basin. As the water was consumed, the head of the family chanted, Now do we consume that which will one day be returned. For the flesh of a man is his own, but his water belongs to the tribe. The communal pool provided the siege with water daily, although less than a litre for a family of ten. The Saiyadina distributing the water to the head of each family gave her blessings, and prayers of thanks were offered to Shai Hulud. Water was also seen as the ultimate bond between individuals, whether or not they belonged to the same tribe. For instance, one who saved the life of another person from another tribe was owed a water debt, not only from the person they saved, but from the tribe as well. The water bond was considered a heavy burden and was paid often as quickly as possible. The water of the dead, if shared with another, also created a bond that was indissolvable. Once such a sharing had taken place, the two groups were no longer seen as distinct since water, once mixed, was impossible to divide. Equally, if an enemy drank your blood, he became white queer with the tribe, joined to them as one of their own, and saved from having his water taken. Hold. Thank you, Stilgar, for the gift of your body's moisture. We accept it in the spirit in which it was given. The dangerous conditions on Arrakis, which ensure that only the strongest survive, have also forged the Fremen into superior hand-to-hand -hand combatants. In Dune, Paul trains his Fremen forces in the use of the Weirding Way, the Fremen name for the specialized Bene Gesserit martial arts that he learned from his mother. Herbert wrote that Paul recalled the stories of the Fremen and how their children fought as ferociously as the adults, and in the novel, the Emperor Shaddam notes, I only sent in five troop carriers with a light attack force to pick up prisoners for questioning. We barely got away with three prisoners and one carrier. My Jubar and my Sardika were almost overwhelmed by a force composed mostly of women, children, and old men. As I mentioned in my video on the Sardika, the Holtzman shield made most projectile weapons semi-obsolete. Energy weapons like the laser guns reacted violently with the shield, creating an unstable explosion comparable to a subatomic fusion that would kill the attacker, shield wearer, and surrounding individuals. Because only a slow-moving weapon could penetrate the shield, knives and swords became the most sought-after weapons once again. 
With that said, the Fremen, however, did not use shields as it attracted the sandworms and drove them into a killing frenzy. As a result, the Fremen have the advantage of not being trained to slow their knives when attacking. The Fremen also used different archaic weapons such as the Mauler pistols, lances, and crossbows to great effect, but the most deadly and prized possession of a Fremen warrior is the Chris Knife, a personally tuned blade ground from the crystal tooth of a sandworm. All young Fremen must go through a ritual confirming their adulthood, which is sealed with the gift of a Chris Knife to the adolescent warrior, and as a sacred weapon of the Fremen, outsiders are strictly forbidden from possessing one. According to the religious beliefs of the Fremen, a drawn Chris knife must not be sheathed until it draws blood. So, when the knife is seen, people tend to scatter. This Chris knife was given to me by my great aunt. It's made from a tooth of Shai Halud, the great sandworm. This will be a great honor for you to die holding. You should welcome my blade. This world will kill you. Quicker this way. In the year 10,191 AG, Emperor Shaddam Karina IV ordered House Atreides to replace their enemies House Harkonnen in the administration of Arrakis. Upon their arrival, Duke Leto I sought to befriend the Fremen. However, because of years of harsh Harkonnen rule and dealings with Imperial agents, the Fremen were at first distrustful of the Atreides. After a while, the Fremen responded positively to the Duke's generosity and even-handedness. He was not a conqueror like the others, but an honorable man that cared greatly for the people under his care. When the Harkonnens and Carinos invaded Arrakis, House Atreides sought refuge with the Fremen. And after the adoption of his son Paul Atreides and his mother, the Fremen saw a rapid and dramatic change in their fortunes. Using an army of Fremen who heard his revolutionary message and armed with the knowledge of how to destroy the precious spice that facilitated all space travel, Paul simultaneously attacked the Empire's outposts while holding the galaxy's spice supply hostage. Within a few years, they'd gone from being perpetually harassed by elements within the Carino Empire to being the foot soldiers of the Atreides Empire and Paul's powerful Jihad. In 12 standard years, the Fremen overran the Imperium. Even though Paul was revered as a god in the flesh by the Fremen he'd freed from imperial rule, history quickly slipped out of his control. The reverence and religious fervor surrounding the Muad'Dib, as well as the need to crush dissenters who might try to reclaim Dune, transmogrified into a cosmic jihad waged in Paul's name. With that, hundreds of worlds and billions of people came under this way of Paul's empire in the early days of his reign. The jihad launched by the Fremen saw the destruction of all military resistance to Paul's power and the eradication of many faiths. Eventually, more than 61 billion people were killed throughout the universe and all resistance armies were obliterated. Though the Fremen were small in numbers, they destroyed and overpowered every single opposition they met. And so, 40 religions got eradicated from the Padishar Empire. Among the Fremen, there was an undercurrent of dissent who didn't like the way that Fremen culture was changing. As Paul made water more available and plentiful, older Fremen looked on in horror as the strict codes observed by previous generations began to disappear. And so a plot was hatched among the Fremen dissenters to assassinate Paul. The rebels are egged on by the Spacing Guild that lost their unfettered access to the Spice Melange and the Bene Gesserit witches who lost control over their breeding program. Paul saw these machinations and his visions, but had trouble knowing how to avoid these plots bearing fruit without causing more misery. Ultimately, he allowed himself to be grievously wounded by the Fremen dissenters and is blinded by a nuclear blast near the Holy City, an attack that he foresaw but chose not to prevent. The strict Fremen way of life held that anyone who lost their sight must wander out into the desert and allow himself to die, rather than slowing down the tribe. And though Paul was an emperor to billions that could have carried on without his sight, in this path he saw a potential future that avoided calamity. In sacrificing himself pursuant to traditional Fremen law, he silenced the doubts of dissenters that were worried that he'd forgotten the ways of the Fremen. Under the 3,500-year reign of Paul's son, Leto II, the Fremen culture diminished. By merging with the sand trout, a kind of larval stage of the great sandworms, Leto II became a nearly immortal human-sandworm hybrid. Using this, he reigned long enough to realize Liet Kynes' great dream of terraforming Dune into a moist, temperate planet. And while he succeeded in this mission, he destroyed the Fremen culture in the process. After all, a culture revolving around water preservation is bound to die in a world where water is in abundance. The last of the Fremen that wished to hold on to the old ways were consigned to a living museum, a pseudo siege called the Serra, where they lived as their ancestors did. Leto was then ultimately killed by one of his descendants, a Fremen Atreides woman named Siona, who developed the ability to hide from his power of foresight. His death set off the Great Scattering, an event that saw the many peoples of the former empire dispersed across the galaxy. 
Without access to the spice, the Fraction people were isolated on their planetary islands for thousands of years. One particularly violent sect eventually returned and bombarded the surface of Dune with planet-destroying missiles called obliterators. The atmosphere immediately caught fire, causing half of it to evaporate, and the immense fireballs scorched the surface of the planet, killing almost all life on the world, sandworms and humans alike. The sand then fused into hardened glass, and with that, the legendary Fremen of Arrakis and their monuments were no more. With that said, that's all for today, folks. A huge thanks to everyone that requested we cover the Fremen of Arrakis. If there's anything else you'd like to request, please don't hesitate to ask. As always, it's been a pleasure. Niat here with Film Comics Explained. Thanks for stopping by. Finally, they sent a warrior out to kill me. And I gotta tell you, I've never come so close to dying. They fight like demons. Desert power. Desert power. This is only the beginning.